Europa dei popoli, Europa degli Europa peoples, Europe of states. At this meeting, and with the exhibit on the symphony from the New World, uh, United Euro from the Atlantic to the Urals, we meant to attach great importance to Europe. Europe as the area where countering uh, the human person emergency is uh, easiest. The value of uh, each individual lies at the very center of the history of Europe. The history of Europe, indeed, is the history of the European Union. We've been seeing as much at a meeting with the Premier, Italian Premier, Mr. Letta, a United Europe where we can uh, find uh, back uh, the mm, man of freedom. Uh, together with uh, cooperation among the peoples, uh, we obviously express the wish for a lasting peace. This is uh, the key that lies the basis of the setting up of Europe, and the exhibit shows that this is also a way to make Europe start again based on our own experience, the experience of many of us as Europeans, because the history of Europe is made up of the history of the man, of the statisticians that led to the setting up of Europe. And this Europe is still being experienced uh, in the men of culture, in the men of church, uh, in the young people, uh, in men of religion that decide to make this common space an area uh, for the making of Europe proper. And what I believe is most interesting, um, given the uh, speakers that I'm about to introduce, well, we have to do as much in a very difficult point of time because there is a global crisis that many have blamed in Italy as well, to the very existence of Europe. For some reasons, this crisis is blamed on Europe, as if it were Europe that had generated this crisis, or at least made it, made it harsher. So at this meeting, Europe of Peoples, Europe of the States, I'm raising a number of issues that I had voiced also by those who were introducing and presenting the show. My question is as follows, is it true or not that Europe has brought about these problems. The monetary union, is it an aiding factor or rather an obstacle? Should we have a two-tier Europe or a common path to integration? The combination and union between North Europe and South Europe, is this possible or is this ma being made impossible? And again, can we truly have subsidiarity in Europe horizontally and vertically? Can we still pursue the uh, universal welfare objective in Europe? Well, there are many open questions ahead of us, and these are all crucial questions. As Italian uh, Prime Minister Mr. Letta in 2014, uh, general elections are going to be held in uh, Europe, and there is a possibility for the arrows those that are skeptical about Europe to win the elections. So this is why this mm, uh, meeting plays a fundamental role within this framework. And uh, we're going to have uh, very important speakers. Uh, Luis Miguel Poyeres Maduro, the Minister for the Regional Development of the Portuguese uh, Republic, uh, an expert in constitutional law, uh, whom we heard last night uh, at another meeting. And then Martin Schulz, the European Parliament President, uh, that had to be with us uh, n last year, but unfortunately um, he couldn't make it, and this year uh, is with us and would like to thank him most warmly for the attention uh, he shows vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Romanian meeting. The meeting is going to start uh, with an opening address by Pasquale Va Valentini, the Foreign Secretary of State of the Republic of San Marino. So uh, we are then going to hear from the other two most distinguished panelists. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the meeting, and it is a great honor for me 
to bear witness to the closeness of the Republic of San Marino to this event, and very specifically to the content of this meeting proper. Finding back the sense of Europe, the sense of unity of Europe, is truly an emergency, but not just for Europe, but for the world at large. The world, indeed, needs to find in the, civil in the civilization that made Europe an important point of reference something based on which to develop a new balance amongst the peoples and the countries to overcome an economic and cultural crisis. What we need is identifying those factors that can uh, keep people united because these are the key drivers that can uh, unite communities and peoples. These are the factors uh, um, that unity is the result of a dialogue rather than of strength. In the history of San Marino, this uh, speculation takes place in a very uh, specific point in time. The European integration process um, has become much, much more urgent. We look for a new type of association. Indeed, the European Union is devising new ways uh, to uh, include and to have a develop association agreements uh, with the small countries and to renegotiate the ECFIN agreement with the third countries. The Republic of San Marino is fully involved in this search and we are fully aware that there's a role we can play, that there is a contribution we are able to offer. As of late, we heard two important people that visited our country and recalled their contribution, i.e. Pope Benedict XVI and the General Secretary for the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. The Pope reminded us that our identity has a strong origin and is the result of a legacy which lies at the basis of our originality. That love for freedom uh, that draws a distinction between our peoples and others and that is basically rooted in Christian uh, roots. In uh, 1296, Martina di Montecucco, that uh, was just but a very simple um, illiterate uh, coming from the mountains in San Marino, was uh, invited to uh, testify at a trial. And uh, the judge asked him, uh, what is freedom? And uh, he answered, uh, Homine esse liberum et habere sum et uh, de Deo non teneria liquinisi dom domino nostro Jesu Christo. The man is born free and uh, he can only report to our Lord Jesus Christ. And this lies at the basis of the independent state of uh, San Marino. And this is what made our country a country of peace and hospitality. UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon stressed again uh, this specific element, pointing out the fact that, that the Republic of San Marino in the group of countries that are all fighting against the conflict developed its own history away from wars. The Republic of San Marino indeed uh, has also committed itself over the years uh, to offer shelter to those who would run away from uh, uh, different wars and fights, and nearly 100,000 uh, during the last Second World War, including a high number of Jews. UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon was greatly impressed by our long tradition of democracy and he referred to the fact that small countries bear with them an original character that can be the bench test for the skill of the international community to get organized in respecting uh, all identities. The powerful lion, his 
strong, but the little bird can fly. This is the image coming from nature that uh, um, UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon referred to, to state that all countries deserve the same expression opportunities, depending irrespective of their size, richness, or geostrategic influence. We are fully aware of that, and we know that oh, there is a responsibility for us to shoulder, and we are willing to uh, play a role internationally. Most specifically, we'd like uh, to grasp an invitation coming from the European Union, and we are fully committed um, to follow the path to greater integration so that we can play a greater role in the decision-making process of Europe, thus opening up new spaces uh, to be uh, active in the single Euro Union, European market of the Union. Uh, we're very interesting in f interested in following the proceedings of these days, and we believe that new thrust for the building of Europe is going to be um, uh, derived from this meeting. And uh, this is the wish that we'd like uh, to share with you. I'd like now to give the floor to um, Portuguese Minister Maduro. Thank you very much for inviting me to come back to Europe and, and to come back to the meeting and talk about Europe. No, I'm not here in my capacity as a professor university of at university but rather as a politician and yet I have the very same ideas as last year and we heard that we share many ideas uh, on what Europe should do we probably do not agree on uh, which is the right party to uh, make those ideas come true and this is something that we said together with the European Parliament uh, Schultz Whenever you talk about the uh, Europe at the meeting, there could be uh, consequences to pay. Mario Mauro was here last year, and he was a member of parliament in Europe. And uh, um, I was here also last year to talk about uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, now we both uh, have different um, roles, so perhaps this means uh, that uh, President Schultz should get ready to uh, wear another hat uh, soon. Uh, so we're going to be there next year uh, um, to see what happens. I'd like to start by way of um, provocation, and that is a joke that I used to tell those to my students. I believe that problems should be looked at in a different perspective vis-à-vis -vis what is the mainstream. There's a joke of a gentleman who's trying to look for his watch that is lost in the living room. And when his wife asks him what he's doing, uh, he uh, answers, um, I've lost my watch in the bedroom. And then uh, his wife said, why are you looking for your watch in the living room since, since you've lost it in the bedroom? And uh, the husband says, uh, because it's uh, brighter here. This, unfortunately, is what happens uh, in the finding solutions. A time to find solutions, so you should adopt a completely different perspective. You have to get away from a comfort zone, from an intellectual comfort zone, and try and uh, devise another approach, another outlook. I like what our culture would bring to uh, do. There's a slide that I wish to share with you. This is the only uh, slide last year. I had some videos, uh, but now since my, uh, I'm here with wearing a completely different hat, I didn't want to be too provocative. Anyway, this is the um, first digital camera ever invented. That was developed by Kodak. Kodak invented the first digital camera, and now they've run bankrupt. Why is that? Well, because 
They uh, thought that this camera was too bulky, was never going to work, uh, and they decided to have traditional cameras with films. Uh, they could not anticipate the future development uh, of this very camera. They weren't able to do that. They stuck to the old production of old cameras with film, and they ended up bankrupt. They went bust. They did. They couldn't use today the approach for the future, and this is what uh, um, made them go bust. Maybe uh, 10 years ago, somebody would come to you and ask you to finance a project for a new encyclopedia. If you were asked by two different companies, uh, one saying, I have a thousand scientists coming from the best university worldwide, Oxford, Harvard, La Sempienza, Sorbonne, so I can rely on all the best scientists. These are the ones that are going to write down the new encyclopedia, and that company would ask you for financing. And then if another company would address you, say, we want your funding um, for our encyclopedia, and uh, uh, they would refer to an online website uh, where everybody could um, write down their um, contents. Uh, you would certainly uh, have given your money to the first group, uh, while well, the second group is now called Wikipedia. Finding a solution for the problems of the future with the cultural approach of the present. So not being able to imagine what the future is going to be all about is what makes politics so difficult. And I believe that this is also what makes it so difficult for Europe to find the right answers. So what I'm asking of you is to carry out some practical exercise, uh, trying to uh, leave your skepticism away or aside. When I table my proposals as a member of the university, there were other pro university professors uh, that uh, would, mm, were talking about eurobonds and other proposals. And then, uh, you know, there were always those who were ready to criticize different proposals. I was the last speaker. I tabled my proposal. Uh, and as a matter of fact, they've also been uh, presented in a report to the European Parliament. And somebody reacted, stating, what you uh, say is impossible. And, you know, what I said is, uh, we've spent one and a half days uh, considering your impossible proposals. We might spend 10 minutes uh, discussing my own impossible proposals. Well, I believe that the, uh, an impossible proposal is the way out uh, to find a solution to problems. I believe that the status quo is impossible and uh, probably the solution is going to seem impossible uh, likewise. So as we did last year, we would like to make an exercise to try and understand what is the true nature of European problems and where the potential solution lies. What is most important is understanding that the very nature of the economic and financial crisis of Europe is also synonymous with a crisis of democracy. Not because the financial crisis of Europe caused a crisis of democracy, but because at the very origin of the economic and financial crisis of Europe, there were problems affecting democracy. Two were, mm, there were two main problems there. One is that one of the main causes for the crisis certainly has to do with the responsible policies uh, brought about by a number of countries when it comes to financial and economic um, matters that they had repercussions all on all the countries at large. And the responsibilities when it comes to economic policies, fiscal policies, and so on and so forth, uh, because uh, uh, the single currency has created uh, such a strong interdependence uh, w brought about to a reaction contagion that uh, widely disseminated throughout the European Union. And this also has to do with democracy. Uh, 
because uh, what this is telling us is that uh, budget policies, policies, economic policies, financial policies of a state have repercussions on other countries of uh, the European Union. Oftentimes, uh, the policies of one state do not consider the potential consequences that those policies may have on other countries, and this is a democratic problem. What happens in our country today is also the result of the policies uh, adopted in other countries. Uh, so there's a very strong interdependence within Europe. A second very important factor of the crisis and I'm not going to say what is, which is one most important or what is the variable that is better explains the present crisis. Anyway, the democratic problem is not one of the countries, but rather one of the markets. One of the cause for this crisis, or rather one of the exacerbating factor of the crisis, is closely related to the capital flows, the unlimited capital flows, especially within the uh, European Monetary Union. Capital flows uh, um, came from the state of the centers for the states at the uh, borders of the European Union, with uh, um, interest rates being kept artificially low, thus creating a speculative bubble that caused the crisis in a number of states. When markets showed some trust in the possibility of these data to pay back um, state bonds, this led to a run on the states as we had the run of the banks, something that further exacerbated the crisis. And this can be looked at also as a democratic problem. These capital flaws are not subjected to democratic control. They are not submitted to any control on the part of the state, and they are not submitted to any controls on the side of the European Union. This problem that has to do with uh, capital flaws may not be corrected by one individual country because you cannot have a single market or a monetary union that are subject to what is done on a national basis. It should be the European Union proper to set uh, a number of democratic controls on what happens on capital flows. The fiscal discipline that we have in the European Union depends on states with all the rules that existing to control the state. But there is another very important democratic problem that is uh, concerned with the um, risk of the externalities having repercussions on other countries. The situation in a country certainly has repercussions on, uh, repercussions on uh, other countries. And this is what uh, Europe is uh, trying and correct. In respect of the political, economic uh, merits of the fiscal policy as the one that we've included in the Stability Pact of the European Union, irrespective of the merits on the advantages and advantages and costs that are associated with that fiscal uh, discipline, there are two things that emerge quite clearly. This fiscal discipline is certainly all necessary to re-establish uh, trust on the side of the market and also to recover mutual trust um, by the citizen from, from on the part of the European citizens. Uh, so the idea is that we should all play according to the same rules. A Europe based only on fiscal discipline is not enough. It's not enough to tackle the crisis that we have to come to terms with in, in Europe. A fiscal union would require fiscal discipline, but also fiscal capacity. The European Union, if only based on the um, fiscal dis discipline, um, is not enough. National political processes uh, should uh, preserve their independence, thus questioning the effectiveness uh, of the European rules 
for fiscal discipline or the financial and fiscal discipline of the European Union should make up some kind of non-political, apolitical space to discipline individual countries, thus questioning the very essence of democracy. The debate which is now present in Europe apparently holds us prisoners of this issue where we uh, have a Europe uh, based on discipline that would run into conflict uh, with the national democracies. And on the other hand, we could uh, rather have uh, a Europe that is uh, uh, held prisoner of an ongoing negotiation among the different member countries. Not granting any potential governance. I believe that there could be an alternative, though. But in order to find such an alternative, uh, there are a number of conditions that are to be met. For one, the European Union requires a true political uh, authority. Without a true political authority within the European Union, there's no possibility to be credible enough um, to gain the trust of markets. This political authority that should be quite clear, and this is also important to have some kind of political responsibility within the um, Union. The diffuse nature of the political authority, whereby mm, we never know who's actually ruling the, the Union, so this diffuse nature of uh, political control in Europe makes it impossible to understand again who is to be held responsible and this uh, um, lends itself uh, to manipulations nationally mm, national leaders uh, um, at times may use Europe uh, to do things that they wouldn't do uh, in their own country Europe institutions know that the implementation of their political choices by national countries by may um, l lead to uh, loss of control. We have to reestablish mutual trust between amongst the countries and amongst uh, individual citizens. There are um, citizens in certain countries uh, that believe they are uh, bearing the brunt uh, for mistakes that, that were made in other countries. And yet the citizens of uh, the latter states uh, believe uh, that there are uh, citizens within Europe that uh, do not show any kind of solidarity and that they are just but openly punishing them to do away with these destructive ideas uh, of the European construction. We have to have rules, we have to have discipline, we have to have a show of solidarity because these are all necessary and these uh, should be correlated to the wide objectives of European integration and arriving at an equal distribution of its costs and benefits. This is why we have to make citizens understand what are the benefits and what are the democratic uh, consequences of uh, uh, the interdependence existing amongst the different countries. So citizens should realize that whatever is done in a country has repercussions on another country. Thus, n making the discipline rules better acceptable. And European citizens should also understand uh, what are the benefits that, that may be drawn through solidarity. And this is why I believe uh, that uh, financial legitimacy should be correlated to a request for further integration within the European Union. The European Union is a tool to transfer the wealth of a, from some country to another country, but this is um, certainly poisonous.
financial solidarity within the union should be re the result of well-being and the wealth which is uh, produced by the integration process in Europe. There's one last condition that we should meet, and that is that we should have political integration. Such political integration should be based on a true European political space. European political integration based on individual member countries, which is what we indeed we have today, is going to bear the brunt of that lack of a strong political will that I so strongly advocated, thus making it impossible to understand what the potential consequences are of a truly democratic Europe. Decisions within Europe depend on different um, political leaders that have to obviously respond to their voters. And at times, uh, such voters do not understand the um, importance of interdependence. So perhaps uh, wrong, wrong incentives are given to the politicians. Uh, they are, do not consider the strong degree of interdependence existing amongst us. Now, I'd like to identify two tangible proposals before I wrap up. And I believe these could account for important steps forward to uh, try and uh, see these conditions or preconditions met. There are two things that I believe we should do even within the existing treaties. And as a matter of fact, these things could bring about a dramatic change in Europe. Uh, and uh, these are as follows. On the one hand, we should have own resources associated with a European balance sheet with a, representing a true fiscal and financial capacity. And we should have also a European Commission that should truly rule Europe with a higher degree of legitimacy. Europe should have an important um, financial capacity. This is all important to make sure that Europe uh, can uh, correct the existing asymmetries and that weaken the functioning of the monetary union. And this is also required to tackle uh, emergencies as the one that we are uh, in today. And I believe this is a better tool than Eurobonds. So a European balance sheet is going to be in combined in or and associated to the own resources of the, uh, Europe rather than to the transfer of risks for individual countries. Solidarity um, cannot be based on the transfer of individual states because this has a negative repercussion on the solidity of Europe. An increase in the resources available for Europe counterintuitively can also m make the Union better legitimate. And I'd like to dwell on this point a bit, but why is this something counterintuitive? A political authority should be understood by its citizens not only for the way uh, it is represented or it pre presents itself to the citizens, but also for what it does. This has to do with uh, the way resources are uh, collected and uh, taxes are levied. The way uh, whereby t resources are collected and uh, um, the ways uh, by which the taxes says are levied implies that the citizens may very well understand uh, what belonging to Europe implies. Resources could be a tool to present the reasons for solidarity within the political community. European resources or own resources for Europe shouldn't uh, just uh, be collected for pragmatic purposes because the European needs funds, but rather they should uh, be legitimated because they identify the very reasons for the existence of the European Union. It is therefore essential that the European Union is looked at as an institution redistributing wealth, its own wealth rather than the wealth of individual member countries.
solidarity should also be connected to the different degree with which different social groups may draw benefit from uh, European integration and most specifically from the uh, domestic market. Now, with reference to the European deficit and to the elections to be held in Europe, well, I believe that the true democratic de deficit in Europe that is very much uh, paid lip service to is in fact based on the lack of a true political space for Europe. We depend too much on the individual member countries that in the end produce uh, the wrong incentives to the operation of Europe because a political organization should not be based on individual member countries since uh, this uh, prevents uh, citizens and states from understanding the high degree of interdependence. There's a problem also in terms of effectiveness. Um, there cannot be any self-governance, which is the very base of democracy. This can only be accompanied by a true capacity to um, rule. This is why we need a stronger Europe. I believe that we find ourselves into a paradox, especially when we come to the role of a European Commission. On the one hand, the European Commission has uh, lost ground when it comes to political leadership, when it comes to the management of the uh, political agenda in Europe. On the other hand, national um, governments uh, are um, enjoying ever greater powers. This is very risky and dangerous. The European Commission apparently determines national policies without any um, right to do so. In this sense, I believe that at the forthcoming elections uh, of the European Parliament, there could be different um, candidates supported by different parties, and this should create a true competition. What makes elections so interesting is that we know that we are given a choice, a choice between different heads of state, between different possibilities of governments. In Europe, we are to be given the same option. All the European political parties or groups should identify their candidates and a platform, a roadmap, and that roadmap should be truly European and should not be national. So um, we wouldn't be interested in having the interest of individual countries. We should have a roadmap uh, presented by individual candidates uh, as very much based on European interests. We would have, therefore, a um, stronger political capital, thus making the European Commission much more uh, effective in pursuing uh, the uh, bullets that uh, make up the roadmap. This is truly a paradigmatic change. And I believe that this is truly necessary. In a democratic Europe, citizens should be able um, to disagree uh, on the way to react to the present economic and financial crisis. Otherwise, the only alternative uh, uh, that is going to be left to them is that to express that they're being uh, for or against Europe. Citizens should be able to put forward different ideas on Europe because otherwise the only choice that we are living them with is to be either for or against Europe. Paradoxically, we see that national elections at times um, are welcome with great interest. In France, for example, and I'm sure the German elections are going to elicit the same interest. Well, in uh, Portugal, for example, all the media 
We're broadcasting debates amongst the different uh, presidential candidates live, and probably the same thing is going to happen with the German elections. So the uh, German electoral debates uh, are going to be uh, broadcast live in Portugal. Why is that? Well, because uh, the president of France or the, um, the forthcoming chancellor of Germany is going to have repercussions on what is going to happen in Portugal as well. And this, I believe, is very telling. And it is also, though, raising a risk, a risk whereby citizens would see, would see that they don't have a say uh, in, in the elections of other countries, uh, whereas the election in those countries uh, is going to have repercussion on their own country, as the case, for example, for Portuguese citizens who do not have a say in German elections, with German elections uh, having a role in uh, political life of Portugal. Thank you very much. I would now like to give the floor to the European Parliament President Martin Schulz. So now we've heard from uh, the Portuguese uh, uh, member of parliament uh, speaking perfect Italian and uh, I would speak a perfect German. And uh, this is why, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear all, I'm going to address you in the language of Goethe, i.e. in German. First of all, let me thank you for inviting me at the Rimini meeting. Mario Mauro, my dear friends and colleague at the European Parliament, had already invited me last year to tell you the truth. But unfortunately, um, I couldn't come um, because of a family problem. And uh, that is why I'm even happier to be here this year and today especially to uh, be involved in this discussion today and to express my opinion. So as to tell you how I see Europe in the future, uh, I'm going to refer to what I see Europe's future is going to be like. First of all, I'd like to go back to what my colleague um, Minister Maduro just said. I believe we should talk about electoral campaigns and we, shouldn't, uh, we should talk about very pragmatically about uh, the um, electoral elections in Europe. The head of Europe, uh, the follower of uh, Barroso, the one that has the most important uh, ruling position in Europe, well, the person is going to replace uh, Mr. Barroso based on the Treaty of Lisbon, which is the uh, Treaty of the European Union that actually enforced. Well, the President of the European Commission, uh, who is going to be appointed and elected, is going to be elected also by means of the European Parliament. And the treaty is quite clear. Uh, the uh, heads of government, so the members of the Council, um, come up with a proposal which is tabled to the Parliament after entering into in consultation with the Parliament, obviously, and uh, in uh, full compliance uh, with the results of the uh, European elections. This is what uh, the treaty states. The rationale of this treaty basically is such that uh, uh, the most important uh, political uh, parties, Christian Democrats, Conservatives, uh, Social Democrats, Liberals, uh, uh, the Greens, uh, um, so these political parties, these political families, as it were, may come up with one single candidate, a man or a woman, uh, to play the role again of President of the uh, Council, because um, the President of the Commission 
uh, in uh, European Commission is something that has repercussion on each individual citizen in uh, Europe and not a Prime Minister Letta and uh, not uh, President Hollande or Chancellor Merck. Uh, indeed, it uh, concerns with each citizen. This is why I believe that all citizens in Europe, uh, in respective of uh, them being in France or Italy, uh, all citizens should cast a vote at the uh, European elections for the Europe European MP and they will have also an impact on the uh, candidate who is going to be chosen for European Commission. So the Socialists will put forward a candidate and also the Social Democrats will come up with another candidate and the PPE is going to come up with another candidate so that in Italy as well this, these candidates uh, may present themselves to the European uh, people so that all the citizens in this country will contribute to the decision-making process uh, to have a say to what happens in Europe at uh, Commission level. This is a very important part of the European democracy, something that we require very strongly. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe is an idea. Europe is the idea which is based on the principles of solidarity and respect. Respect for the peoples, first and foremost. Respect of the individuals and solidarity amongst the peoples. But Europe is also an uh, ideal based on the respect amongst individuals, not just amongst the different peoples, uh, in the best uh, respect amongst individuals. So each man, each woman, irrespective of the country they come from, irrespective of their religion, irrespective of their beliefs, irrespective of their nationality, irrespective of their job, irrespective of them being rich or poor, irrespective of them being black or white, each individual citizen, each individual person living in Europe deserves the same degree of respect. And one of the main problems that we have to come to terms with in um, Europe is that we often refer to figures, digits and structures. We should talk about the role of individuals in Europe. I believe that the idea of Europe is one that requires there being a community of people in Italy where each individual lies at the center of the debate and the political action. In Europe, we have uh, to go away from digits and move on uh, to in make sure that all individuals enjoy full respect. The idea I'm referring to, well, this idea was uh, uh, tabled in the 20th century. The 20th century had two main components to it. In the first part of the 20th century, in the first 50 years of the 20th century, well, we should focus on that part first. What were the guiding principles for this uh, first half of the century? Hatred, war, racism, power was wielded, an imperialistic attitude was shown. During the First World War, seven million people lost their lives. Soldiers coming from different countries that all came to die. Soldiers, people who had been tried in the spirit of the 19th century. People and soldiers who believed in the ideals of honor and of the battlefield. And yet they died on that battlefield and they ended up with the new technologies of uh, the 20th century. And then the Second World War, later on, 55 million people lost their lives. Six million Jews uh, were killed in Europe. 
with Auschwitz being the um, top of the uh, shame in the history of mankind. Uh, so again, we're referring to the first half of the 20th century. Then in the, 20, in the second half of the 20th century, we saw the signing of the European treaties, the idea based on which countries uh, could work together, crossing borders, uh, because we know that uh, when we act with a cross-border approach, we may come to set up common bodies and institutions so as to promote mutual trust, so as to control one another even, to see whether we can establish common barriers because we know that uh, um, united we are stronger than individually. That was the basic idea of Europe. In Italy, the idea was represented by the Gaspar in German, by Adenauer in Belgium, by Puck. This is the ideal of Charles de Gaulle, Adenauer. There are ideas, there were ideals, ideals of great men, of great women who were so brave. as uh, to, again, put forward these ideals, and their lives were very different from my own. I was born in 1955. Perhaps uh, I am a first generation in my country, in Germany, who can say that right from uh, my birth, um, I haven't experienced any war, only but prosperity and richness and well-being. This is the only thing that I have come across. I never suffered any hunger. I uh, never suffered any from any poverty. Uh, my father uh, had been born in 1912. He was a kid at the time of the First World War, and then in the Second World War, he was a soldier. This is the main difference between my uh, our father's generation and my own generation. The, our lifestyles are completely different. The uh, original idea of Europe was uh, that to come up with an historic reaction to the wars so that the second half of the 20th century would be completely opposite to what happened in the first half of the 20th century. So the idea was to oppose respect to hatred, peace to war, wealth to poverty. The idea was uh, to have cooperation instead of a show of arms. And now there's a question that I wish to raise to you. Why? Don't we show any trust in Europe? Well, the most important achievement of uh, Europe is its very existence. This is something that we have to fight for. We have to fight for the ideals of Europe. Dear friends, this idea is put at risk, is jeopardized. I am a European politician, and what I say to my colleagues at European level is as follows. By the way, I'm saying likewise also to my national colleagues. We should be aware because whoever criticizes the European Union, we should be uh, concerned. As a matter of fact, it is not true that all that are against Europe are uh, Eurosceptical. I, say, for example, do move some criticism vis-a-vis -vis Europe, and yet I'm a strong supporter of the very ideas and ideals of Europe, obviously. We can't say that everything is right. The European Union finds itself at a different situation. Our continent is the richest worldwide. Um, and yet, 
We make it possible for some areas of this very rich con continent to have as many as 50% of the young people uh, not having any job. This is a shame. This is something that Europe is not worth it of. I'd like to tell you an anecdote. I'd like to pay the utmost respect when I say something now with the reference to the European Union. A year ago in Madrid, I met a group of young people between 18 20 years of age. Some of them are at double degree. And all of them were unemployed, all of them. I talked to a young man of 26 years of age. I stopped talking to this uh, um, woman. She was an architect and a psychologist. She had a double degree herself. And she said so. Uh, she said, I have a double degree. I'm both an architect and a psychologist. And uh, I commented on the strange combination of the two degrees. Uh, how come that you decided to study these two uh, subjects? Uh, and she answered, uh, architects tend not to know anything about psychology. This is why they build homes where nobody can actually uh, live. And then I asked this uh, lady, how come you became a psychologist? And I said, you know, people with technical degrees tend not to know anything about psychology, and psychologists know not, nothing about technical details. And yet, we live at a time of great technology. Uh, this is very much the century of technology. And I believe that this young woman should have deserved a job before the very answer she gave me. And yet this lady told me, this young lady told me, there's no room for me in Spain. There's no job for me in Spain. I have to go elsewhere. I have to go to Latin America. I didn't tell her that the ambassador of the country where uh, she wanted to go a few uh, days ahead had told me, to me personally, that his country in the near future would have closed up its frontiers uh, to Europeans. Again, Europe is the richest continent worldwide. And yet, year on year, there are some 10, 20, new billionaires, many rich people. And yet, a young woman as bright as the one that I just uh, described to you had uh, to flee her country and go to Latin America. So I'm not surprised to learn that young people do not trust the European Union. It is very true that the uh, um, continent is very rich and then wealth is not uh, rightly uh, distributed. The unjust distribution of wealth is a lack of respect, is tantamount to a total lack of respect when the European Union we have to understand that we can only be strong provided that we are together. If the rich people believe that that they can pile up ever more money and if the poor people don't have a lawyer um, defending them well this cannot go on like that forever we cannot accept to have a financial system in Europe 
were finance can sit on the fence and just wait for uh, the real economy um, to recover. The main problem for SMEs in Italy as well has to do with access to uh, loans. In Greece, for example, and in Portugal as well, and in Spain, there are banks that have 0.5 interest rates that may take money uh, at 0.5% uh, um, from the European Bank and they use the money of the European Central Bank, but that, that money is not invested in the real economy of their own countries, but rather they divert that money on uh, the speculation and the financial environment and then the um, small entrepreneur in Bologna or in Rimini then requiring money, requiring loans is not granted any loan at the same interest rate. As a matter of fact, no loan is given to them because um, the banks ask for guarantee before they issue loans and no company ever can issue those um, guarantees. And this cannot be accepted any longer. How long can we tolerate this? There's lots of money available, but this money is never given to those who actually need them. There is not given to those who are requiring investments. Uh, this money should be funneled to the real economy because it is with small to medium enterprises that this money would be used because they, that I, the, it is a small to medium sized enterprises that could generate employment, it could create more jobs. And uh, there is a super qualified generation of young people that have the right to find a job. But I'm telling you, this is not going to go on forever. We cannot have money being made available also for the financial markets. Uh, we have to solve the problems of economy and loans. Uh, we have to get away from this point of stagnation. By the way, I'd like to launch an appeal here. I'd like to address all national institutions, or all the institutions in Europe as well. to say that we cannot talk about uh, bank recovery. Well, certainly this is something that has to be done. We have to make banks healthier, but we also have to discuss about our financial systems, our banking systems, so that money is actually made available to investors, uh, to um, real economy, to the companies proper. This is something that has to, to be said quite clearly. And then to make my voice even better understood, income coming from speculation are certainly attractive. Well, that money is nice for those who actually can pocket that money. But you know, 59%, well, for up to 96, 97% uh, um, of the people, there is no gain in the speculation. So if we want to improve uh, trust in Europe, if we want to uh, enhance the financial and economic system in our country, we have to change something. The minister said something very interesting. We all, we're all very much focused on national elections, each of us. True enough, the result on uh, September the 22nd in Germany will certainly bear on the Germany, but also will have repercussions on Italy, as well as um, France, uh, uh, as well as any other country. In Germany, we looked with close attention to the elections so to be held in Italy, as if those elections were held in Germany. This is what happens. Italy uh, sits in the G8. Italy is one of the eight most developed um, economies worldwide. Italy is one of the most important industrialized countries worldwide. 
clearly enough, stability in Italy is synonymous with the stability in France and in Germany as well. So there's an appeal that I wish to launch from here. We need Italy. We need it, you. Italian is a eh, das wunderbare Land. Italy is a wonderful country. It's a country where the sun always shines. But the day when I go to Rimini, it is pouring today. <laughs> When we look at Italy, uh, you know, for mm, Germans, people daydream since Goethe came to Italy. Italy is a wonderful country, it's an extraordinary country. Italy is a great nation, let me say so. Now, I'm not mistaking that to pay lip service, you know, to the country. I don't want to praise you. But I just uh, I'm firmly believe in what I'm saying. Italy is a wonderful country. The constitution in Italy is one, including the employment and labor as one of the top values. The Italian constitution that refers to labor in the very first sentence. Italy is a country where dignity of mankind should always be the very focus. Italy is a country that plays a pivotal role in the democracy of Europe. Italy has always uh, taken up a leading role in democracy in Europe, has always contributed importantly to democracy throughout Europe. So again, Italy is a true pillar for Europe. And this is why we badly need a stable Europe Without a stable Europe, there's never going to be a stable... Oh, I'm sorry. Without a stable Italy, we're never going to have a stable Europe. But by the way, a caveat there. Those who talk about economic problems, beware. Europe should not be divided into Southern Europe and, su and uh, Northern Europe, whereby in the North we're all well off and in the South is all wrong. Uh, in the north, there's efficiency. In the, or in the north, there's n uh, there are jobs. And in the south, everything is wrong because there's no efficiency. Well, if there's a high unemployment rate, if there's a, right, if there's a high uh, state leverage, if there's a high debt, if there's a recession, if there's again unemployment, recession, and deficits, well then, the parameters uh, uh, are such that uh, England becomes a country of Southern Europe. I firmly believe that this country has the strength in itself to overcome the economic and financial crisis is now in. I firmly believe in this because uh, Italians, whenever a crisis took place, whenever a harsh crisis occurred, always found their creativity, always did their best, made an effort, and developed a creative attitude that made them focus, that made them work, so as to show that the state was available to all citizens, for the citizens to feel protected, for the citizens to be uh, seriously considered, so that public institutions are there to serve citizens. This is what we should do in Europe as well. Europe is not an end in itself. Europe is a tool, as, uh, as Minister Maduro just said. Uh, he's, indeed, he said that Europe is a tool to get to something that we all badly need. 
We have to understand that we never have to fight with the ones against the others, but we have to cooperate the ones with the others. The Federal Republic of Germany, my own country, contributes uh, to its GDP with its exports to up until 35%. We are the two champions of export. 60% of our exports end up in the uh, domestic market of Europe. One of the main country um, for our exports is indeed Italy. If Italy is not successful, well, this is going to have important repercussions on our own well-being and vice versa. If we are not doing well in Italy, are not doing well, so we have to have a win-win situation. In order to have that, we have to have a good economic and social politics, so a good financial policy and a good cooperation. And this is what I wanted to say to react to the question that was raised at the beginning of this session. What kind of Europe do we need in the future? This was the question. Well, the Europe that we need is one who has clear ideas on the fact that 500 million people coming from 28 different countries representing the richest con continent worldwide, well, all these people, if they join effort together, if they cooperate, if they are close to one another, if they share common plans, if they are willing to show solidarity, the ones among towards the others, if they can interact also with other regions worldwide, well then, I think that it is worth protecting our values, the values of social justice, the, values, uh, the value of respect, freedom of opinion, f free science, freedom of teachers, the ban on torture, the abolition of the um, death penalty, the right to strike, the right of uh, meeting up together in assemblies. Well, I believe that these values should never be questioned. And those who are not willing to comply with such values worldwide, those who, who are switching off the internet when they don't want to have any opposition, women and children working 14 uh, uh, hours a day for a dollar in mm, plants at the times uh, um, are uh, set on fire and without leaving them any uh, escape with the farmers complying that in the little river within their farms there are poisons. Well, that farmer may be tortured and killed and found somewhere just uh, thrown away from his home. Well, I cannot accept that these things happen. I want Europe to be strong. I want that we all join efforts together to cooperate in Europe so as to have also competition And yet, we cannot depend on competition um, so much so as to renounce our values. There are other continents worldwide where perhaps uh, um, products cost less, but why is that? Because uh, there are no salaries deserving this name because the, these countries do not enjoy the right to strike uh, because torture still occurs uh, and because you might get killed. Because there's no freedom of expression, because uh, people are taken advantage of, because natural resources are wasted. If dictatorships and totalitarian regimes in the long run will be 
more low cost than democracies, then democracies might lose the battle. So in the 21st century, the community of democracies uh, should join efforts together to say aloud that if you wish to have access to our markets, you have to you comply with our values. This is no European imperialism. This is no European imperialism whatsoever. This is synonymous with the protection of our values that we have um, to arrive at, joining efforts together, so as to disseminate freedom and respect in other areas of the world where there are still people who are treated as slaves, who are deprived from their rights, who are taken advantage of, and that is a shame. So my Europe is a Europe of respect and cooperation. Respect is a top priority, in fact. Respect for the cooperation amongst peoples uh, and countries, irrespective of the borders and the frontiers, because we know that together we are much stronger than we are in isolation. Thank you. Tre brevi conclusioni a questa a questo discussione. La prima abbiamo sentito dalle parole del presidente Schulz quello che abbiamo cercato di esprimere nella mostra. Questi ultimi Over the last 50 years We uh, made achievements uh, so important as to enable us to live uh, according to our lifestyles. We share in the same generation of President Schultz, and even younger people should understand that. So we know that uh, we don't have one block opposed to the second block. We are living in peace, but this is not to be taken for granted. So. This common effort uh, is a precondition for us living in peace. Just think about uh, the war in uh, former Yugoslavia. You may very well understand that it is easy for war to break out. Another subject that was covered by Minister Maduro and by President Schultz uh, is as follows. Without experience, you cannot uh, go anywhere. At the Exhibition, they ask, uh, what is the connection between our own experience and that of the, those who wrote down the Constitution? So why don't we talk about the experiences of individual workers, of entrepreneurs, of citizens, of students? Well, as the Gaspari was saying, uh, we have to support this. We shouldn't see populism prevail we have to consider something that has at a higher level than the states and uh, that is, is identified in the exhibition that there are uh, experiences such as that of the CERN in Geneva and the European Space Agency well, these are the areas uh, for as Erasmus students uh, where this democratic consensus is built. And then we don't want any Europe. The Europe that we want is one that which is for development, for social justice, for democracy, consensus. This is the Europe that we want to fight for, not just any Europe. Uh, and this is also touched upon by the exhibition. Europe has to be synonymous with political development also for this aim. At the Rimini meeting, we want to fight for our presence being felt. We want to follow also our high-level politics as uh, uh, Italian Premier Letta said, 
We don't just want to confine ourselves to consider uh, Italy, but the, uh, the rest of Europe as well. Thank you very much.